So what I'm going to talk about in this lecture is really all of physics, actually, all of the known physics at the moment, uh, plus a lot that's guessed. And so the lecture is going to be even more extensive than the ones before, because there I was only dealing with two particles, and now I have to deal with, oh, I guess it's two dozen particles. But first, I I'm going to divide this talk into two parts. First, I'm going to talk about questions that are directly related to quantum molecular dynamics of itself, supposing that that was all there was in the system, electrons and photons, uh, what problems are associated with that theory alone? And the second set of questions has to do with what is the relation of this stuff to the rest of physics, to nuclear physics, gravitation, and so on. So start with uh, problems of uh, quantum molecular dynamics which I suppose now that the theory is completely understood and you know what I'm talking about because you were here at the other three lectures. <laughs> Most uh, shocking characteristic is this crazy framework of amplitude. And if you would think about there being problems, you're sure that problems must be associated with that. But the physicists have been fiddling around with this now for 50 years and we've gotten very used to it. A, B. All the new particles, all the new phenomena having to do with nuclei and higher energy, et cetera, et cetera, always turn out to fit perfectly with every hypo everything that you can deduce from supposing it's a framework of amplitudes whose square is probability and interferences and so on all appear. So that the model structure of the world, the framework of the world which I described, has no experimental doubt about it. You can have all the philosophical worries you want, but there we are. Because it's an experimental science, we have no other way to go. There's another set of problems, which are technical problems, having to do with improving the method of calculating the sum of all the amplitudes. You make all these pictures, and you have to add all these numbers, and you have different kinds of techniques that are available in different circumstances. And of course, that is what the graduate student learns how to handle and what takes so long to learn. And of course, since it's so technical, I'm not going to discuss it. That's just the continuously improving techniques for analyzing what quantum electric dynamics really says in different circumstances. But we have one additional problem that's characteristic of the theory itself. That I we have a particular problem that's characteristic of the theory itself, which, as a matter of fact, was the reason why it took 20 years from the time it was first invented in 1929 till the time it was first correct, uh, satisfactorily used in 1949. And that has to do with this problem. We have in our theory. For example, if we start with an electron here, we have a certain amplitude that it gets to here, which we can supposedly calculate first by supposing it goes directly. And that amplitude uh, is a direct function, a very uh, precise function that comes from relativity that contains a particular number in it, which I wrote last time as me. And I'd like to write this time as m sub in. Now that we put in to the theory, uh, we have to just put it in and then find out what results we get and, fi and find out what number we have to put in there to get agree with it. This is the amplitude that a particle starting at 1 will get to 2. I think I wrote it this way last time. And depends on the mass of the object. However, the real amplitude to go a long time from position 1 to 2, oh, I also told you last time that the amplitude was constant in space and you added this all together then you'd find that the amplitude to find it at a time to simply rotate it at a certain angular rate, the angle would keep turning at a rate depending on the mass, m. But in fact, there is the total amplitude to get from point 1 to point 2 all con so contains other possibilities of which this is one, that the electron could have emitted a photon and reabsorbed it. And the electron could have emitted two photons, or a photon twice and reabsorbed it, and a, a whole lot of other diagrams that you keep on going. Contribution from these various diagrams, if this one, for example, is of order c squared, where c is a number that goes every time there's a junction, or called a coupling, and c squared was equal to 1 over 137.03599, and so on. We haven't done it experimentally. We're not sure of this within a 3, you know, plus or minus 3. But that's determined also experimentally, so that the predictions of the theory agree with experiments. Now, the thing that's important I'd like to emphasize that because of the other amplitude, the real total amplitude to arrive at the time two, supposing, let's say, that the initially it was equally equal amplitude to be everywhere in space, 
does not revolve, the phase does not turn at exactly the original value, but turns at a different value because of the contributions of these other values. This one would go around at this rate, the, the angle, the amplitude to arrive at the complex number, which with time, time T2 changing, goes around. After you've added these, it's again a complex number, but it doesn't, it goes around faster or slower, different rate. Now what we measure when we measure the mass of an electron in an experimental world is the rate that it goes around. The mass of an electron is its energy. The mass and energy are equivalent, as Einstein showed, and uh, energy is equivalent to frequency, as I guess it was the Broly showed. And uh, so I keep saying mass and energy and frequency interchangeably because I'm so used to that. At any rate, the frequency or the mass or the energy of the electron experiment, the one that we're going to measure experimentally is not the one we put into the theory. So we have another mass, which is the mass experimental, which we could see would be expected to come out something like this. If the C square were small, very small, and you want to forget it to 1%, you know, forget that 1%. This term is of order C4. You would say first approximation comes from this amplitude, you'd get something like that. And then you'd have a correction because of this thing, which would have a C squared times it. In other words, some correction with 101%, something like that. A correction that you'd compute by adding these diagrams together, and then maybe C4 times another correction, and this and so on and so on. That's easy to understand. Now, it, it also, to, it, now, when we make a calculations of any other physical result, it's much more convenient to express the answer in terms of this m, which is a measured value, than it is in terms of that. So we have a habit of writing all the answers. Or we imagine we might start with a number like this, calculate everything, and express everything in terms of the experimental mass that we measured, which is the sum of all these things. So all answers are calculated in terms of the experimental mass. Now, if you've understood me at all, you probably don't understand why we got made such a big fuss of that, because that's just a matter of convenience. I, it's just a question of whether I put it in here and compute that, put it in here, or whether I direct, put it in directly. The difficulty is, and the peculiarity, the thing that bothers us, is that this correction that you multiply C squared by is infinity. And the fact that it comes out infinity because this function and the one for the, this was the electron one, and for the, the amplitude that the photon gets from here is the same fun from here to here, this point to this point actually, not two to one, I should have said that. In here, we're just going from here to here. That multiplied by the same function for zero mass and then added everywhere comes out infinity. And, uh, that caused a lot of trouble for the first people who invented this theory. They, thought they saw they were getting infinity for every answer. Because in every problem that they did, there was something like this in it somewhere. An electron going from one place to the other would always be possible to emit a photon to absorb it. Every answer to every problem was infinity. It was noticed by, in, by 1949. It was 20 years later, it was noticed by Beta and Weisskopf that if the answers were put in terms of M experimental, it looked as if in spite of this being infinity, when you wrote the answers in terms of that and computed them, there was no infinity. All the infinities canceled out. So that if you would express the answer in terms of the final M and not in terms of this one, then everything would be finite. It looked that way, and it, would took, uh, it was just a matter of uh, checking out that, in fact, that was true. That's what was done by Schwinger and Tomonaga and myself. I got prizes for that. But uh, <laughs> one way you could say all this is that this number is unavailable experimentally. It doesn't mean anything you put it into a theory. Let's for a moment imagine it, well, so that whatever this is, I can always adjust this number so this comes out fine. And if this is infinity, I put minus infinity in for that. And that's one way of saying what we ultimately are doing. Although this looks like it comes out in infinity, we put minus in, uh, this comes out, let's say, not infinity, 10 billion, right? Then we put in 9,999,000 and only get one. <laughs> so if this, or whatever this is. So uh, the idea is that this is, goes toward infinity in a calculation. We just say, well, just keep on adjusting the M so that it's a fix it back so that the M comes out finite. 
Now, you laugh at that because you have some kind of a feeling that's a dippy way to do mathematics, and it is. And this dippy way to do mathematics is the way we do this theory because we don't never been able to straighten it out. But we do know that if we do this dippy way, we get results which agree with experiments. If it had been that this correction were finite, there would be no problem, of course, because the fact this would be some number and there would be another number. But the fact that the correction is infinite is very annoying. And there's a result of that. It has turned out it is not possible to prove at the present time that the entire theory of the quantum dynamics that we've written down is really self-consistent, that there's not some, if we calculate everything extremely accurately, we wouldn't get into some difficulty in itself, that the mathematical structure of the theory is self-consistent. There's a nervous condition that there's something wrong with the need that we start with a nice number and have to put minus infinity and play games like this. That it annoys us, okay? So that there's one problem, what I have to say, is that in this, although the calculation, this calculational scheme is quite definite and we know exactly what to do, this process, which is called renormalization, uh, we uh, are not satisfied that, we're, that it's a mathematically legitimate process. But you notice that when we compute the ten decimal places, it agrees with experiments. So it may be all right and may be a real theory. Another way to describe this business is the following. In making all these calculations and adding over all possible places for, uh, for the, in this case, there's a contribution, one and two is here, but in our problem, where I'm having trouble, let's call it three and four. And we would have this at four and this at three multiplied by the photon going from four to three, which is the same thing at zero, man. And, and when it turns out that was when four and three are very close together that these both things rise together as they get close together, but so much that when you add all the possibilities, you get infinity. So one way of saying this is, oh, your whole idea that you can have two points infinitely close together is nonsense. Your whole thought that space can keep on going down to the last notch and you can use geometry to the very last infinitesimal distance is wrong. Suppose we stop these sums when three and four are closer than some very tiny distance. Let's say a distance that's shorter than any distance or any wavelength or anything we're able to get experimentally then this correction comes out quite small. Well, it depends. If you make the distance sufficiently small, then the correction gradually builds up. In order to make this correction term equal to this, so that this has to be zero, sort of, it turns out that the distances that you have to use are, are absolutely, well, I can't even, it's no use trying to describe them. They're like 10 to the 100 power or something like that, 10 to the minus 100 centimeters, whereas all we can do experimentally is 10 to the minus 15. That means some, some, oh, I don't know, 80, 90 decimal places further on than where we are. So it's always possible that nature's different five or 10 decimal places down. 